Um, make sure that you mute your microphone unless you're speaking, um, so we don't have, because we're getting some echo, and it, it very well could be my computer, so just in case. Okay, well tonight we um, are going to try to accomplish a couple of things. First, we're going to talk about um, and just review some ideas around um, PLCs and specifically why they are beneficial, um, how to make them effective and productive, and then we're going to close out by talking about how do you handle conflict um, in a PLC. Um, so I'm also looking at the chat over here and Kimberly, I'm not really, sh I guess I don't see the whole thing, maybe. So what is it that you were looking for? Is Kimberly with us? Um, yeah, sorry. Was she um, so on the bottom of this paper, uh -huh. it said the step three and refer to the SharePoint for more detailed information about each goal. Use your district or your parish. I can't seem to find anything. Okay, um, a lot of times you're going to find them under board goals, um, so uh, you might want to look there, um, and I will be honest with you, there are lots of districts and schools that don't have goals, which is a huge problem in and of itself. Um, so if you can't find them or they're not available for your schools or your parish or district, just put in there that it's not available. Okay. Um, and um, like I said, that's a whole other discussion about why that would be problematic. Okay, I just wanted to check. Thank you. Uh-huh, you're welcome. Any other questions, guys, before we get started tonight? Okay, well, without further ado, let's talk for a minute about some of the benefits of PLCs and why being a PLC leader is so, so important. Um, so there's lots of definitions for PLCs. Obviously, we are using the ones primarily from Brick G4, um, since he is sort of the... the founder, I guess, of the professional learning community concept. Um, but there is another one that I like as well. So a professional learning community can be defined as a group of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic, who want to deepen their knowledge and expertise in whatever area they're discussing by interacting on an ongoing basis. So a lot of people tend to think that PLCs should and only exist in schools. That is absolutely not true. PLCs are a model that has been adapted and used across disciplines, businesses, etc. Um, for example, um, if you're familiar with the idea of instructional rounds, um, that is a form of a professional learning community that was actually developed by Dr. Richard Elmore. Um, he was a professor at Harvard. He took his idea for instructional rounds from medical rounds that they use with medical students and medical residents. Um, they're also used a lot in um, various business applications. In fact, we actually teach some courses in our um, MBA program here at LSUS um, that talks about different structures. They don't call them PLCs, but basically it's, it's a pretty simple com concept um, and can be used across different um, like I said, different uh, businesses, uh, concentrations, you name it. So before we start, though, a PLC, I think we have to really think about some um, values as well as some assumptions. So before you start a PLC, hopefully, you're working in a school where everybody feels like they can actually make a difference. And that no matter how successful or how poorly your school is performing, that you can make a difference and, and create momentum for improvement. The only way, guys, and I was reading a really interesting article today um, about uh, what we need to do to really improve schools. And it, I, I thought he had a, the author had a really interesting premise because he was talking about the fact that we tend to try to improve schools by remediating the problems. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with that, you know, RTI, we do all kinds of remediation programs, et cetera. But in reality, if we are focusing solely on remediation, we will get slight improvements in achievement, but we will not get the kind of gains for all children and all students that we need or expect. Because the real way and the most um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? I, I think the most effective way to really improve a school is to improve our people and to improve the systems that work within a school. So significant school improvement that is focused on improving people, improving their skill set, and making sure that we're focusing on everything that we need to will actually impact very effectively teaching and learning. So within a school, you not only have to have that center focus on um, student achievement and instructional effectiveness, you also have to have strong organizational leadership. If you've ever worked in a school that was chaotic or not well run, um, that definitely affects everything. You also need good sound instructional leadership. If you're working with a team of leaders who do not understand or know good instruction, that could be a problem. And then finally, you have to have effective teaching. So like I said, remediation is good, but it's not the key. It's not gonna get you that sustained improvement or um, growth that you're actually looking for. And yeah, Chris, I will definitely post that article for you guys. So, what makes a PLC effective? Uh, you know, hopefully your only experience with a professional learning community is effective, but I will tell you I have never, I, I have unfortunately had too many experiences in a PLC that wasn't running well and wasn't at all effective. So in order to have an effective PLC, there are some best practices that you need to institute. Number one, there should be a shared common vision. Everybody should know and understand and buy into what it is you're trying to do and accomplish in your PLC. I think I may have told you guys before about some of the organizational structures that I put into place when I was a principal. And we made sure that our PLCs were focused solely on teaching and learning. Nothing else could be discussed in those meetings. That was our entire focus. So we sort of, um, I don't know, imposed upon the group uh, what their shared common vision is, but that is essential. And guys, if you're in a school that does not have a really solid vision, mission, values, or goal statements, it's gonna be very difficult to do some of this. Hopefully you can help educate your leaders or you can take over and become the leaders um, and help them to craft and develop that. And not only does that need to happen at the school level, it needs to happen as well at the district level and the board level. Um, in, a, in a great system, there is alignment between those. Um, so, you know, whatever's happening at the school should be aligned with what's happening at the district office, then that should be aligned with what's happening at the board level. If you're in a system that that's not taking place, you can still do this. You can start even at the classroom level. And what is your vision for your class? What is your mission? And hopefully as people see that that's effective and helpful, it will begin to grow. You also have to have what I would call a collaborative culture. Now, a lot of people talk about culture of schools all the time, but they often confuse culture with climate. So I wanna make sure you really understand the difference because they are two very different and distinct things. A school's climate is basically the way you feel when you're within the school. So if you've ever had the opportunity to visit multiple schools, there's sometimes schools you walk into, it just feels like a good place to be. People are happy, they're friendly, um, you know, it's a welcoming, warm environment, there's lots of, you know, color and visuals and things like that. That's the climate. That's just the way it feels. The culture is much different. The culture is how you go about doing it. And that is, that is very much influenced by the things that your school values and who you believe that you are. So for example, tradition can be a part of the culture. So we can affect climate pretty easily. That's not hard to impact. You can train people to be nicer and to be friendly. You can make the place look welcoming. It can be clean. Those are climate issues. Culture is much more difficult to change, but it is extremely important and the most impactful part of what you can do to improve a school. If a school does not have a culture that's focused on students first, high expectations, achievement, setting and reaching our goals, working collaboratively, all of those kind of things. If that's not in place, you've got a lot of work to do. And I will tell you, if you are working in a school that needs some really strong school improvement, um, if I were the leader of that school, that's the first place I would start. 
because until you establish the culture or the mindset for everybody, again, it's really, really difficult to get this going. You also have to make sure that people are results oriented. And let me give you a very concrete example. When I first became um, a school administrator, we were trained um, to go into classrooms and observe teachers. And when we did that, we were watching the teachers. And so, you know, oftentimes we were evaluating on how great was their lecture, how good was their information, et cetera. Well, we grew up a lot and we, we figured out as a system that it really didn't matter what the teacher was saying or doing or how brilliant their lecture was. It was really mm -hmm. all about how well were the students performing. You know, you, pretty much anybody can get up there and do a great dog and pony show, but if it's not impacting student understanding and student learning, then they're not an effective teacher, bottom line. So it has to be about the results. And I know a lot of us push back when we talk about accountability because it's been rammed down our throats. But we also know that the only true measure of effectiveness really is within the students. Second, you have to have it, or excuse me, I'm second, we're on what number one, two, three, number four. You also have to be in a school that is action oriented. Um, so I do a lot of advisement and talking to students and coaching and stuff like that. And I, I find myself saying this all the time. You know, it really doesn't matter what you say. What matters is what you do. The proof is in the actions. And so if you're in a school where people talk a lot, nothing ever changes and there's no action, that is a problem. An effective PLC is really going to be focused on the actions. Okay, so action orientation. Um, number five. There also has to be collective inquiry. Um, so, you know, I know at EDL 707 right now, we're talking about data and gathering it and using it and all of those kind of things. Guys, I could give you a truckload of data, but if you don't have that collective sort of mindset that looks at all of this information and has that inquiry-based thought process, it doesn't matter. We have to be curious. We have to be willing to dig in, and we have to be willing to really connect the dots between data, teaching, and learning. If, that, if those dots are not connected, again, our students fall short. And then finally, a PLC should have a supportive environment. So that includes both internally, but also externally. So for example, um, the article that I was reading today that, that I thought was just really good, he talked about the fact that, you know, how often should PLCs meet? Well, according to this particular author, he said they should meet every two to three weeks for 45 minutes to an hour. They can meet more frequently, but that's sort of the minimum that people can meet and do this. So in order for you to have 45 minutes to an hour to meet as a professional learning community, leaders have to create conditions where that can happen. And that can be done through master scheduling, before and after school meetings. There's, you know, um, I know that I would even try to, every single grading period, so once for us, once a six weeks, we would bring in subs, and we would have subs who would cover a certain group of teachers in the morning, and then we'd switch and they'd cover a different group of teachers in the afternoon. So we could have at least once every six weeks a three to four hour professional learning community retreat. We give our teachers that extended time that really matters. Um, so somebody wanted to know culture, the sound cut out. So culture is, is like I said, how you go about doing stuff. It's the traditions. It's, it's the, you know, we, I used to say this all the time at my school. It became sort of a mantra for us. The MacArthur way to do blah, blah, blah is, um, you know, and, and that just became the way that we talked. You know, sounds hokey, but it worked. So how do we know that learning communities are effective and how does it benefit teachers, but also how does it benefit students? Well, for one thing, you know, there was a time and a day, and unfortunately it does still exist in some schools, where you go into your classroom and you close your door and you do your job. And at the end of the day, you go home. And there's not a lot of discussion or dialogue or collaboration. PLCs are a vehicle to decrease that isolation that teachers sometimes feel in their classrooms. 
It is also, if you're already in leadership, I think you'll back me up. It is extremely isolating to be a school principal because there's only one of you in a school. So I know that when I was an assistant superintendent, we really worked hard to create principal PLCs as well because they needed to have the opportunity to work together, to bounce ideas off each other, etc. And we had a formal PLC once a month, but then I offered optional sessions. We did an optional breakfast and an optional lunch session. And we a lot of times, particularly at those breakfast and lunch sessions, there was no set topic. It was just bring your problem or bring something you're celebrating and we'll talk. And I was really amazed. My principals never, ever missed those optional sessions as well. Because that ability to collaborate and talk with your peers is essential. Okay? Um, somebody, yeah, let me see who I can mute. Okay, I think everybody, it's looking like everybody's muted. Is that better though? Yeah, I'm not, hang on, let me, we've got two pages of people. Let me just double check here. Yeah, it's weird. Sometimes I can't mute if people are not, if they're not on a webcam, if they're just on a phone, it's hard to do. Okay, I think, does that help guys? Does, is it better? Nod, if it is. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> um, also, two PLCs help teachers because there's not only that shared commitment, there is that collective responsibility. Um, you know, whether we like it or not, one teacher can affect an entire school's rating. Um, you know, it, it actually happened to me uh, as a principal. Uh, we were pushing really hard in Texas at the time. The school ratings were um, unacceptable, acceptable, recognized, and exemplary. Obviously, recognized meant that you had 80% or more of your students meeting a standard. Recognized was 90% or more. And we, we wanted to get to exemplary so bad, we worked our tails off. And when our um, results came in originally, we thought we'd made it. Well, once they got the final results from the state and everything was broken down, one teacher who taught our ESL students in English language arts, we had made exemplary in every single category except Hispanic writing um, for one grade level, and it cost us that exemplary rating. So, like it or not, guys, if we're not all, if we're all, we're all held to a standard collectively, so we also need to share that responsibility. It also does increase morale. PLCs have been proven as one way to increase morale. Um, I get, off, I get um, asked a lot, you know, what is morale? How do you improve it? Um, and a lot of people, you know, it's interesting. I know when I used to do interviews for potential principals, that was one of the questions. You know, you're, you're going to a school that has very low morale. What are some, you know, concrete steps you would take to improve the morale? And I would get things like, oh, we have donuts on Fridays and stuff like that. I'm telling you now, that does nothing. The teachers like the donuts, and that's a nice gesture. It will not improve your morale. Morale comes with success, with a positive school culture, and with achievement. So PLCs are one way you can actually improve morale. So next time that you're out there thinking about interviewing, if you get a morale question, do not say buy donuts. Um, give them the much deeper, better answer. So that's just a tip for getting a job. How does it help our students? It helps to increase their understanding because there's continuity and consistency from teacher to teacher. It also helps to decrease achievement gaps. Believe it or not, research has shown it also decreases the, abs it decreases the absence rate for our students and it does improve and increase academic success. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the statistic, but for every day of school a child misses, it can it can cause them to have a 1% drop in their achievement. So if you've got a child with chronic absenteeism, it's pretty hard to teach kids that aren't there. So we have to address that as well. So we've talked a lot about, you know, and, and the processes and how you do it. It's really pretty simple. You do some pre-work, you do some planning, you collaborate and discuss, you share and you meet. And that cycle happens all the time. So it never ends. Um, sorry, I'm looking again, seeing if there's another cell phone maybe that I missed. Sorry. I think I've got everybody now. I think we're okay. Let me just look again. Yeah, we're good. Okay. 
Um, so anyway, that is a cycle that never ends because you are always continually working, collaborating, and discussing. We've also talked about what are those questions that need to be asked in a PDLC? Pretty simple. What do our students need to know? How do we know if they know it or if they've learned it? What do we do when students don't learn? And what do we, fourth question, how do we respond when we know that our students have mastered the content and we need to do more enrichment or add-ons to our curriculum? And I think I've shared with you guys that my vision of the RTI triangle. Um, so how do you go about dealing with and building that kind of supportive environment? And especially, how do you deal with conflict? I'm sure all of your PLCs, everybody loves each other, they're all best friends, you spend you know, the holidays together and all that, and you don't have any conflicts. Uh, but just in case in the future, if you have a conflict or have a member who's creating chaos and, and difficulties, let's give you some ideas on how to do it. So, if you are setting up a PLC, one of the things you need to do immediately is make sure there are good communication structures. What does that mean? There should be an agenda. It should be published prior to the meeting. It should include those things that address the vision, mission elements of the school, as well as those particular achievement areas that need to have a strong focus at that time. You also need to make sure that there is enough time to meet and to actually share. A 20-minute PLC is not very effective. On the same note, a two-hour PLC is too long in most cases. So, for example, um, some of you may have heard of the book, The 10-Minute Manager, and I had a principal who just thought this was the best book ever. Um, so she decided to have a 10-minute PLC with everybody, every department in her buildings. So like Mondays, it'd be 10 minutes with math, and Tuesdays, it'd be 10 minutes with science. And honestly, you know, trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, um, I went in and started observing some of these PLCs. Despite what that book tells you, it didn't work. You could never get to depth and complexity of conversation or learning in that short of a time period. At the same time, if you're still going two hours later, you're probably talking about stuff that is not that important. So you have to build in conciseness, clarity, and strong communication. That's why an agenda is so important. You also need to make sure that everybody in that PLC has a role. There are time limits for discussion, and those time limits are enforced and used. So timed agendas really, really matter. You also need to make sure that resources are available to your team. So they shouldn't be spending time getting on the computer, looking up a particular thing, or trying to pull some data, or pull in lesson plans, or whatever. All of that should be planned for and established prior to the meeting so people can come to the meeting with the resources they need. I know in my school, we actually had a room that was called our data room. Um, the teachers fondly called it the war room. Um, but we kept in there all of our achievement data. We had our charts up and our graphs up. We had our data notebooks. We had our curriculum. We had, um, like, if we were using a particular book um, to sort of guide us, we would do that as well. So they had a room that was only used for PLCs. It was sort of a sacred space. It was fully stocked with, you know, chart paper and anything else they could need. So when you went in there, everything was available. So I, you know, I would encourage you to do that if you have that kind of space or room in a school as well. It worked really, really well. The leader also has to model and establish respect and trust. If there's not trust between the leader and the teachers and faculty, then teachers are gonna have a very difficult time in a PLC. So also remember that there's two kinds of trust that as a leader, you need to be able to establish. It is that organizational trust, and it is that relational trust. Now, what do I mean when I talk about organizational trust? That gets to the culture. So everybody is clear on how we go about doing things, what we believe in, what we value. That is organizational trust. So let me give you a concrete example. Um, when I was principal at Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Dallas, we were an art school. And one of the things that was 
really becoming problematic for us was that we had all these community members who saw our school and our very, very talented students who were music musicians and dancers and actors and visual artists and all of that as free labor. So we were constantly getting bombarded with requests from the community to perform at this meeting or to have students create this mural or whatever. It really became overwhelming. So in our leadership PLC, we talked about, you know, how do we do this? So we want to have good community relations. A lot of these people were very high-powered, well-known names in the city that you really didn't want to get on their bad side. Um, and some of them were even financial donors to the school. So we were walking a pretty tricky sort of rope there with this. But at the same time, our kids were getting absolutely burnt out. And it seemed like all they were doing was going out and performing. And remember, we were still held accountable to the same academic standards as every other school, even though our focus was on the arts. So we came up with what became a very strong cultural element, and that was that our core business is teaching and learning. And we put it on our website, we branded it, we did all of that. Because we had to build organizational trust around what mattered. So when the Ross Perot's of the world or Ross Perot juniors of the world would call us and they wanted us to send a, you know, a quartet for their, you know, dinner music at some whatever. Um, you know, we would tell them, we're so sorry. Thank you for your request. Uh, we wish we could accommodate. Um, but you know, our core business is teaching and learning and we don't have anybody available. And we would refer them to another school that didn't get all those kind of requests so that those other schools got the exposure. That's how you develop organizational trust. We were consistent. It didn't matter if you were Ross Perot Jr. or the mayor of Dallas or, you know, Joe Blow off the street. You all got the same answer. Organizational trust has to be that consistent. Relational trust is basically how you treat people. So as a leader, if you do what, if you say something, you follow through and you do it, you're honest, you're open, all of those kinds of things. Both elements are needed to have an effective PLC, and leaders must model that, and it has to also be seen in the PLC. So, once those structures and environments are in place, you have to then begin that planning process. And like I said, we've talked a lot about this, so I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, but make sure that you have, um, you know, created and done the stuff ahead of time that is prepared for the meeting. So now let's talk about what happens when you're actually in the meeting and how do you handle conflict. So does anybody have, um, we, you don't have to use their real name, but you could, I guess, because we wouldn't probably know the difference. Um, I want you all to think of a member of a team or committee or group or whatever, colleague, could be your next door neighbor, I don't care. Someone who you would say is maybe difficult to deal with. Does everybody have that sort of stereotypical person in mind? Okay, Rebecca, describe yours. So this may have happened today. Um, we are setting up PLCs for next year and um, we have a band director who's been um, put in charge of setting up the PLCs and he wrote the script for everybody and then just said, never mind, I'm just going to give it to the faculty and teach them how to lead a PLC for all of the core departments, but he's never taught in any of the core departments. So he went the Gestapo approach. Yeah, those are fun. Good example. Thank you. We'll come back Sorry. to yours. Somebody else give me another example. I will call on you shamelessly. Somebody volunteer. <laughs> okay, Erin, go ahead. Um, in the administrative meeting, um, when we're trying to make decisions about achievement and getting to results and changing systems, a lot of times um, we have a particular member who will get frustrated or uh, lose interest and will deflect away from our outcome we're trying to get to. So nothing ever gets resolved or decided or a commitment to a decision and gets, he, he gets very impassioned when he deflects. And so a lot of times I feel like we're spinning our wheels. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you've got the Gestapo people who will do anything they can to derail the process or the team. You've got those who tune out, but they don't really tune out because they're constantly doing either irritating things or interrupting. Um, they'll not listen at all, and then one thing will be said, and they'll jump in with their, you know, 
opinion or whatever. You have those that are the passives, uh, passive aggressives, who, you know, will be fine in the meeting, agree to everything, then they'll go outside the meeting and do nothing but talk trash. There are so many different kinds of personalities that can come to a PLC or to any kind of a meeting, um, you know, that we're working with. So I want you to think about, for a minute, conflict. Most of us hate conflict. You know, it's something we tend to shy away from. But whether we like it or not, conflict is normal. And there is going to be conflict within your PLC, especially as you're beginning to form the PLC. Managing conflict is hard. However, it can be managed and it can be overcome. But we also have to, and I think we talked about this a little bit last week, you sometimes have to figure out what is the root cause of the conflict or the problem that the person is bringing to the table. So remember, how we respond matters greatly when we're dealing with um, those, con those people who are difficult. And we talked about competing, collaborating. Did we talk about this last week, guys? Sorry, I'm one of those people that I tend to, you know, I teach so much that I forget what I've told everybody. So whether it's competing, collaborating, um, compromising, avoiding, or accommodating, we have to get to that root piece. But let's talk about some, um, how do you know when to use which style? Any ideas or thoughts? How do you know? Like if you're Rebecca and you've got the Gestapo guy, what do you do? Let's talk about this in practice, in practice as opposed to in theory. What do you do, guys? I used facts today. I okay. laid out the data and the facts and just kind of broke it down that way so that way logistically they could see what was in front of them rather than to give false scenarios where there wasn't proof on what was actually happening. Okay, very good. Um, an example from LSUS just happened yesterday, in fact. Um, we have a particular department chair who, um, his department's not doing real well. Um, their enrollment has decreased by 50%. Um, uh, lots of students are opting out and moving to other programs. It's just not going real well. And the, the department chair's defense is, well, you know, He's giving all of this anecdotal sort of data. You know? Well, they say that our graduates are awesome and you know, they're getting hired here and blah, blah, blah. Well, our dean, who is a very data-driven kind of person, pulled the actual data. And I I'm not kidding you. When I saw the visual, it was truly astounding. Here you see all these graphs that are going, you know, they're kind of flat line and then they just shoot way up with enrollment. I mean, it's like these huge spikes. And you see his department, and here it is, it's got kind of flat lining up here at 400 students, and then all of a sudden it nose dies. So like Rebecca said, you can use facts, you can use data, you can use information and refute what they're saying. Now you don't want to do it in a very aggressive kind of way, but you know, data doesn't lie. Facts and information don't lie. And you know, when I'm dealing with that kind of personality, I just keep going back to the numbers. You know, while you may while you may have anecdotal data and evidence, you know, people are telling you that our graduates are great, explain to me why the numbers are like this. Tell me how we went from 400 students, now we're down to 198 in a relatively short period of time. So you keep pushing it back on them. I also would really encourage you, like with um, Aaron's example um, as well, and I see over here, um, Jennifer, that's awful. Um, if you haven't read the chat, read Jennifer's as well. Um, yeah, going with hard numbers, it, you turn the story around. I also am a huge fan of coaching, um, and I believe that I can pretty much coach anybody into the place I need them to be. And how do you do that? You listen. 80% of what you do is listen, and then 20% of the time you're asking just really good targeted questions. So when I'm dealing with a difficult personality, I just keep bringing it back to them with questions. For example, um, so you don't think that we need to have a PLC uh, because it's a waste of time. So what would you do instead of a PLC? Okay, they answer. Then I might say something like, um, okay, uh, you, you think that working in isolation is, is the best way to do this. Um, so tell me, why is it that your achievement results have declined by 15 percentage points every year versus 
my third grade team, which has a very effective PLC, and their achievement scores have increased by 45 points. You know, I'm just making stuff up. You just keep bringing it back to them. You also get the group to really become powerful in addressing them. Um, when I was a high school principal, I had a teacher that I could not stand. I'm just going to say. So I thought she was disgusting. I thought she was nasty. I couldn't hardly stand to talk to her. Um, and so I had to assign an assistant principal to her because I would probably not have been very professional in dealing with her. Well, she wasn't well liked by her teammates either, um, and, but for good reason. She didn't participate in the PLC. She was always trying to derail them. Um, she was not an effective teacher. She happened to be an Algebra One teacher, and so, you know, Algebra One is a foundation course, and so the kids that had her for Algebra One struggled in geometry and in pre-cal and every other course because they didn't have algebra scores or algebra skills based on her, um, and it was really problematic. So I remember distinctly one day my department chair came to me and she said, Tracy, I need to ask you something. I said, sure, what? She said, do you trust me? Yeah, of course I trust you. you know, I'm thinking this is a really odd question. She said, okay. She said, I just need to know that no matter what, you trust me. And I said, of course I do. You know, I have complete faith in you. So little did I know um, that in their PLC, the entire team had decided to confront this teacher. And so it was almost like an intervention. So they sat down and one by one, each person, and they made it not personal, it was very professional. Each person told this teacher why they did not think she belonged in this department at this school. And they included things like, you're not a team player, you don't participate in our collaborative lesson planning. You never do your part of the data analysis. Your students aren't prepared when they come to subsequent courses. We have to reteach your course because of your failures. And one by one, they went around. And they said, you know, we don't want to, we're not trying to hurt your feelings or whatever, but you know what we're about. These are the things that are, we value. Here are our norms. Here are our expectations. And you don't fit here. You may be the greatest math teacher ever, but we're going to respectfully ask you to find another school. Well, lo and behold, the teacher did. She ended up resigning. And um, afterwards, my department chair came and told me what she did. And I'm just like, oh my God, you're going to get a suit. But it, it, really, it really hit me. They did something I could have never done because they were so powerful and so committed as a team to their students and their students' success, they were able to help a teacher go to another school where she could be more successful, and I didn't have to go through the heartache and the difficulty of trying to do a termination. So teams can also affect that negativity within one of your PLCs, okay? Right. I, I have a question. How, yes. would you, how would you deal with um, what I would call a sort of subculture, where you have two sort of, you know, who are bonded, who sabotage, even though it's a small group, two or three, maybe they have a long relationship, maybe even they came from another school and that relationship continued, but so you don't have even players, but you have to deal with that group. I, so I'm, I'm sort of at a loss of how to approach that. Yeah, and, and I've been there, uh, that sort of, you know, group that's your... I used to call them lounge lizards, you know, just because that's where they seem to live and breathe and breed. A um, couple of ways. Uh, number one, I would try to find within that group who is the strongest opinion maker for the school or the group. Um, you know, usually there's one really, really strong personality and whatever they say kind of goes. And I would have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and coaching with that person to see if I can pull them into some of the things we're doing by making them feel important and valuable. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of a particular teacher that I had who was very much like that. And, you know, sometimes, you know, this sounds terrible. I sound like the world's worst person. But I would sometimes purposely set him up and let me give you, I mean, this is, I mean, like I said, I'm not proud of this, but I kind of am. We were up for our National Blue Ribbon Schools of award, award, you know, and this is, and they were on campus doing our site visit. And one of the things we were really proud of, and this was back in 2000, we had a one-to-one -one 
laptop initiative where every student, all 3,000 of them had their own laptops that we used. And it was very much embedded in our instruction. And like I said, it was pretty cutting edge for 2000. Well, this teacher thought that was the stupidest thing ever, so he posts on this on his door this big sign during our national blue ribbon, you know, site visit to see if we actually get the award. You know, the whole school is psyched about this. He posts absolutely no laptops allowed in this classroom. So we're like, what do we do? We don't want the team to see this. You know, if we take it down, we're just creating confrontations with him, and then it's going to spread like wildfire. So. One of my assistant principals had this very brilliant idea, and he got a Sharpie out, and he wrote on the sign, excuse my language, F-U doctor and his name. So we took the sign very carefully off the door, and we went into his classroom, and we're like, doctor, doctor, yeah, whatever. Somebody tagged your sign. Do you mind if we keep this? We need it for evidence so we can catch the, the student who did this. And he's like, oh, yes, absolutely. Please, please do that. It completely diffused a very bad situation, took away his power. Um, yes, we were lying, but, you know, it was for the greater good was sort of our, our thoughts. Um, but when we did that, he actually started believing because, you know, we, we, were, we were serious about this. He began to move over to our side of things because he saw us now as advocates trying to help and protect his professionalism. The other thing that I've done, um, quite honestly, is with those people, I put them on, I, I bring them in, and I, you know, because it was actually part of, there's a code of ethics in Texas for educators, and we had board policy, that you can't talk badly about the leaders or fellow teachers or whatever. We found all the evidence we could. I put them on a growth plan and wrote them up, and I terminated them. I just got them out of the school. Um, because it's, you know, it was either pull you onto our side by hook or crook or get you out completely. Um, and like I said, Judy, it's just, you know, you just kind of have to know the person and, and, you know, I would talk to other leaders in my campus about, you know, how do we pull them in? Um, and, and quite honestly, I only ended up actually terminating one individual for, um, causing cultural kinds of problems in our school. Everybody else, we somehow found a way um, to pull them in uh, and get them where we needed them to be. Uh, you know, and, and in some cases, I even made them leaders uh, because, you know, they, they were feeling um, like, you know, nobody listened, nobody cared. So I also have been known to give them so much responsibility that it sort of overwhelms them, and I keep them so, so busy that they didn't have time to be gossiping and doing all that. Um, kind of thing. Um, also, too, uh, because where this seemed to grow and happen was in the lounge. Once or twice a week, every one of my assistant principals and I would go sit in there, and we would do just informal chat sessions um, over lunch. So we just tried to find ways where there just wasn't a lot of opportunity for that. Um, and like I said, I, I was amazed as our culture grew how our teachers began to take care of that. So that probably doesn't help a lot, but at least kind of gives you a sense of where to go with some of this. Yeah, Guy, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so when you're talking about this um, process of um, dealing with this difficult person, mm -hmm. and you had the teams, the team members were was it a, like a meeting where they were all indicating orally or was it a written thing that, hey, we don't like this about you or you need to do this or whatever? How, how do you actually implement that? Yeah, um, thankfully it wasn't in writing because that could cause you some problems. Um, it was all done verbally. It was in their normal PLC. Um, and they just said, hey, before we start our PLC today, um, you know, Teacher X, we, we really need to get something off our chest. Um, and, you know, in, in the spirit of openness and honesty and transparency, uh, you know, this is really weighing on us. And, you know, if you're going to be an effective member of our team, you need to know where we're coming from. And this is a great opportunity. Like I said, I had a really awesome department chair because she really set it up well. And she said, you know, we want to tell you where we see issues, how we can help and support you. And if, if, if you're not, you know, if we can't make this work, it's not in your best interest to be here. And it's not in our best interest to continue this negative kind of relationship. 
Tracy, I'll add this to the conversation. We, yeah. my principal and I have been at the school that we're at for a year, and, and we are a, um, we're a private Catholic school. Mm-hmm. So we're in, the, we're in the process of changing the culture of the teachers. And, and we, so when, when Tracy talks about the culture, it is so important before you move forward with any PC, PLC, you've got to do whatever you have to do to get all the teachers on board. So in the vision class, I, I'm actually doing this right now with some of our teachers. We actually are having the, the teachers define what the vision looks like in their classroom. And so when, when they put that into their own words and what it looks like, it's a lot easier to get them into this, into these groups because they now know what the vision is. They know what the expectations of the staff is. And, and some people, you can only go so far with some people. And my principal always tells me, he says, sometimes you just got to call people on their BS and, and just bring them in and just tell them this is exactly how it is. If you don't like it, maybe this is not the best place for you. We can do that because we're, we're a private school. We can just cut them loose. But the, the vision and the mission is so important and selling that to the entire faculty before you put them in these groups. because And you'll know kind of by the reaction to that, what groups to put them in and who not to put them with. So all that stuff ties in together before you get the PL, PCLs growing. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's a great point. And I could not agree more. Um, as a principal, when I went into a new school, we spent one year <laughs> developing vision, mission. I, we went really far. We went, we did vision, mission, um, values and beliefs. We created a motto. We created a tagline. We actually went through, if you're familiar with the marketing approach of branding, um, we actually went through a full-blown branding approach. And like Chris said, there's a lot of different ways to get all teachers involved in doing that. And that eliminates a lot of the problems. Um, There's also a great book, too. It's a really short, little, thin book. It's by Todd Whitaker. It's... um, I think it's 15 things great principles do differently. It's something great principles do differently. He has some really quick, easy kinds of tools that you can use. But, you know, I'll go back to, um, you know, some researchers who say you've got to get the right people on the bus. Then once you get them on the bus, you got to get them in the right seats. Um, so, you know, guys, the worst thing you can do if there's conflict is to ignore it. I'm over here reading about Robin's uh, scenario and the principal would just sit there and stare at the teacher. I would never tolerate that. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I'm just a, I don't know, kind of a bitch, excuse my language, but you know, if you were in a faculty meeting and, and when I went to the big high school, you know, it was sort of the norm that the coaches all, and I love coaches, don't get me wrong, my best friend's a head football coach, but they would sit at the back of the room with their feet propped up in the newspaper open while the meeting's going on. Well, that didn't work with me because um, I would go over there and take away their newspaper and tell them to sit up straight and move their butts to the front row. You know, if, you, if you're assertive about how you do things and you set those expectations, people will either fall in line or if they don't fall in line, it's kind of like disciplining children. You know, there has to be an immediate consequence. And, you know, and I was very clear about my expectations. You know, you're a professional. If you want to be treated like a professional, behave like a professional. And if you're not behaving like a professional, I'm going to call you on it. But at the same time, I was very open. And if I did something, because, you know, when I wasn't perfect, gosh, I made tons of mistakes. I really encouraged my teachers. And I had a lot that did that would come in and say, you know, you kind of blew this. And I'd be like, you know what, you're right. And, you know, I was all for the public apology to my teachers. Um, but when you do that, it goes back to like Chris said, that's how you develop culture. It's that openness, transparency, clear expectations, getting everybody to collaborate and discuss and, you know, cuss and whatever you need to. That's why we spent that full year working on culture. Um, Really, really important. We're also having our teachers sign the belief statement on the altar, too. That probably works. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's something you had that I couldn't do. (laughs) A little little strong. Yeah, there you go. Um, But I also know after two years, when we were really starting to rock as a school, I remember that moment when I stood up in front of the whole faculty and I said, it's time for all of us to make a decision. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is where we're going. This is the expectation and this is how you must behave 
not literally, but this is what we expect of our faculty. And, it, and, and if you don't think that's all good and right, it's time. I'll write you the best recommendation. I'll even go out and help you find a job. But let us, don't hold us back. Let us help you find a place where you can be successful while we're being successful going this direction. And that year I lost 34 teachers. That's not, I'm 34 out of 250, still a lot. But, you know, my superintendent called me and congratulated me for losing 34 because they were the 34 that needed to go. But everybody else was putting that same pressure on the teachers. Um, so how do you bring on their way to, yeah. You know, it's funny, I had the most success with my teachers who were close to retirement because we found a way to re-energize them. We found a way to take all of their historical institutional knowledge and honor and capitalize on that. Um, and, and we honestly, we treated them sort of like they were, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, like in other cultures, you know, the elderly are revered. We really worked hard to revere the history that, that, the, that our retiring teachers brought and made a really big deal about them. And, and honestly, yeah, they became some of my best and strongest teachers. <laughs> yeah, well, coaches about their paycheck is more on teaching, yeah. The other thing too, guys, and we're, we're gonna get off task here just a little bit, we need to close out, but one other thing too, it's not only how you treat the existing faculty and setting those expectations, it's also how you hire new staff. We had the most off the wall kinds of questions when we would interview new teachers. We always interviewed in teams. In fact, you had four teams you had to go through to interview and get into our school. And those teams included students, um, support staff, as well as teachers, administrators, et cetera. And we would ask things like, how important is it that you be friends with your students? Um, and we had an answer we expected. We wanted our teachers to be friends with our students. Not like, you know, we're gonna hang out on the weekend friends, but you know, to have that relationship. How important is it that you get along with your coworkers? I mean, we had, you know, I could teach you how to teach. I didn't want to worry about that. We wanted to make sure your mindset and your belief system aligned with ours. Very few schools interview in that way. Most people ask you about your content, your teaching practices and all that. Yes, I wanted you to have good content knowledge. I wanted you to have some good practices, but we had our way of doing stuff. What I couldn't always teach people was how to get you to buy into our values and our culture and all that. If I had you on that end, we had great coaches and you know we could teach you the pieces of teaching you didn't know. So really different kind of interview process. People were shocked, you know, when a stu and the student had the final word on whether or not you got hired. Um, you know, and I was kind of amazed when, I, you know, I were in high school and the teacher would never even, the applicant would never even look at the student. I'm like, you guys can't teach, you won't even look at the kid. How are you gonna teach, you know, 35 of them at once? So just a real different kind of mindset is the way that we did things. Tracy. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to say something real quick, um, something that spoke out to me today. Um, we um, got two new teachers this year for our department, and it was a great, you know, new mix. And finally, it seemed like we were going to have a collaborative year, and we were doing great with our PLCs. And I just want to know if anyone else has experienced the ups and downs, because we were like, yes, this is awesome. Like, we're common planning, common assessments. This is great. And then... Um, our assistant principal sent out a good news snapshot and highlighted just one of the teachers. And then everyone got upset because we're all doing the same thing, but he happened to walk in just that one teacher session. And so trust was almost broken. It was crazy how quickly it dwindled. And so like when you said everyone, you need to get everyone on the bus and then find everyone's seat on the bus. And so like what I learned this year is everyone needs to feel valued and feel important in some way. Um, but it's, we're still exploring new territory. I mean, we got to see how it goes this year. I mean, what would you say about that? You know, Lauren, I would go to that assistant principal, my team and say, yeah, thank you for the kudos to so-and-so, but it's really a team effort. Um, so is there some way that you can 
recognize the team as opposed to individuals or, um, you know, maybe give them some, or, you know, I mean, I had a teacher who did this and at first I was kind of offended. Then I was like really thankful. Um, she actually wrote a, a paragraph like for our, our newsletter or whatever, where we did good news. that was about the team. And I'm kind of like, well, I write the newsletter. Why? But then I thought, you know what? This is awesome. So actually what our newsletter became was teachers writing all of it and recognizing each other. Uh, we instituted um, a whole teacher recognition thing uh, where teachers would, you know, write good stuff, put them in the box, and then um, we would put them on um, PowerPoint and we'd scroll them, you know, like during a faculty meeting or at lunch or whatever. So we just kind of just shift the mindset to recognizing each other as opposed to me picking out great things that I saw. So it was just an education for us, and I think you could maybe help to educate your assistant principal. Um, I know teachers gifted me with books strategically throughout my career um, that were very nice signals on, maybe you ought to try this. Yeah, it was a good thought, but then it kind of just backfired on team collaboration. Yeah, and, and you know, and I maybe would remind him, like, if we're all about collaboration, how can we recognize, you know, and, I, and you know, how can I help you recognize the collaborative efforts? Is there something I can do? I know you're so busy, you know, I'm from the South. I've always believed, you know, just don't bless your heart and I can convince you of anything by being super sweet and nice and volunteering to do some of the work. Okay. All right, guys, well, I don't, um, I, I'm sorry, we've gone long tonight. I hope to get you away a little bit early. Any burning pressing questions? Real quick about the midterm, guys, um, and some of the projects and stuff that you've got going. If you don't have what you need to complete a certain element or whatever, don't worry about it. Just put not applicable or not available or whatever. Um, you know, I really just want you to get familiar with these tools um, because when you become the principal or the superintendent or the whatever you aspire to be, um, I hope that you have that backpack full of stuff that you can pull out in any given situation and go. Oh, I've got this that gives me a starting place. Um, so, but like I said, don't really, please don't fret, fret about assignments, okay? Any other burning kind of questions, guys? Well, I'm sorry, I've preached a lot tonight. Um, next week we won't preach as much. We're just gonna start kind of closing things out. So thank y'all, have a great rest of the night, and we'll talk to you next week. Stop.